Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for attending this uh, uh, this part of the, of the conference. Um, this is a session on standards trade and regulatory policy post EU exit. Uh, and I'll, I'll start by saying that that in this this unprecedented and and challenging time, at the time of economic dislocation and uh, and, and lockdown, where, wherever we are, I know some of us, uh, some of you, are not in the in the UK as well. And of course, at a time of far too much uh, personal tragedy, um, it, it's easy to forget that that within uh, just about seven months, the UK is going to go through uh, the biggest overhaul in the, in in its regulatory landscape in well, certainly at least thirty years since the creation of the EU single market, quite possibly since the UK joined the EEC back in the in the early mid seventies. So. What we want to do within this session is to, to give you an update on the aspect of, of this change that relates to, to standards. So that's about EU exit transition and beyond the transition as well. The role of standards within, within the UK and, and what we're doing this time, which uh, I know a number of you have, have been in these sessions before that, I, that I've run with the team. But what we're doing this time for the first time is, a, is a, uh, a, a little bit of a deeper dive on trade and trade policy that we've, that we've not done before. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm, I'm Richard Collin uh, uh, from, from BSI, and I've been working in market access and uh, market surveillance and standards and similar issues now for over, over 30 years, uh, right across Europe and, and also other places internationally. I've been in BSI uh, over, uh, of course, over just approaching 10 years now, head of European and national policy, working in Scott Steam and David Bell's standards policy team. Uh, and I'm responsible for standards policy issues relating to uh, standards and regulations, a link between them, trade policy, excuse me, and, and consumers. And I'm joined in this session uh, by my colleague, Frank Faraday. Frank, can you introduce yourself as well, please? Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, greeting, greetings to all. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, Frank Faraday, as, uh, as, as Richard said. My, my role within BSI is to, is to look into... Um, how trade policy will uh, influence, uh, impact on, on our world of, of, of standards, trade policy and trade agreements, looking in particular at the uh, trade agreements that are currently being negotiated uh, by the UK, now that it has uh, recuperated a, a, an amount of, of, of sovereignty, uh, of regulatory autonomy, and um, uh, looking more broadly at issues uh, linked to the international trade system and the WTO, and how multilateral trade can be um, affected by um, affected by standards and, and promoted through, through through the use of international standards. Thank you, Richard. Uh, apologies, jumping forward there, Frank, while you're talking. Um, uh, so I'll I'll start with uh, with with some some context, uh, um, and and you'll see here the the outline of the session. What we what we're going to look at. We're going to talk first of all. About where we are now, where, where where we are in the in the UK in the post EU exit, what that means for BSI and Centelic now, transitional periods, working through the transitional period and and beyond, and where that takes us, where we see that taking us as uh, as national standards body for the UK. Um, then we'll move into how British standards are supporting UK public policy post transition, and the, these are the two main areas that we're, we're talking about. We're talking about part on regulatory policy as standards will support regulation next year and, and beyond and then as i said that and, and, and frank has, has outlined as well a section on trade policy we plenty of time uh, i think to ask questions we have uh, we have an hour and a half for, for the whole session so we have many good opportunity for questions later on uh, but of course you can get in touch with us with us anytime there's a slide at the end with our our email address uh, but i think most of you are aware of how to, how to get hold of us uh, you can get hold of me or, or Frank, and I should mention that also Jeremy Gray is is here. He's uh, he's running the show for us and uh, a part of our team. So, starting with a with a bit of context, um, I put uh, BSI in the UK in the middle of this slide. But, uh, standards in the UK are part of a of a, of a global network. It's a, an international system that we work in, and within this international system, we aim to have one standard that's used everywhere for any given aspect of a product or a service or for a process or for a test method or, or whatever it is. And we aim wherever possible to go international first. 
we see that international standards bring the greatest benefits uh, for the use of standards in terms of market access, in terms of reducing barriers to trade, and in terms of supporting consumer protection globally. So within this international system where we're looking for one standard to be used everywhere, we see that the international standards that we, that we look to develop throughout through our stakeholders is to be adopted as a, as a national standard. And this idea of taking the international standard and adopting it as the national standard is mirrored around the world, most of the way around the world, certainly. Um, and so that's very that's that's the global system within which we work. And I've put on the on the, the side this side of the slide also um, the, the regional European system. And the regional European system is very important to us, and it forms part of this international system. Um, the regional European system of SEN and SENLEC, so that's uh, the electrotechnical standardization within SENLEC and, and all other sectors with the exception of uh, telecoms within, within SEN, um, is, is, shows how this international system can be taken and given a, a, greater, a greater expression, really, it's developed further. We adopt international standards within SEN and SENLEC as European standards, and indeed, Will develop European only standards if there aren't and it isn't an international standard to adopt. And the, the difference comes within the rules within the, the system. So within the, all of the 34 member countries, whenever a European standard is adopted, every national member must adopt that as a national standard, must withdraw any conflicting national standards, and then cannot start work on, on anything that would conflict with the European standard. So standstill, adoption, withdrawal, the key tenets of the European standard system. And the and what that gives us is a real, true uh, ex exemplar of one standard used everywhere, because if within that system, we have 24,000 European standards that are identically adopted across the 34 countries. And you see, this is really is the way in which you, you enable market access. You can show we all have the same standard. We use the same standard. This is the way in which our businesses place products on the market, the way in which our consumers get involved in standard development and so on. What that then gives us within the UK is a, is a national catalogue of, of truly global reach. We're in this international system, and so the majority of the standards within our, system, within our national catalogue are international standards. You can see the figures here. There's some 38,000 standards within the British Standards Catalogue. Uh, and while these figures here show that it's 16% national, I think, in fact, these are, the, these are uh, figures I need to update because I think the, the latest figures show that this is now 15% national because year on year, 95% of the standards that we're adopting as British standards are European and international. So that, that segment of national standards each year drops a little bit more. What you'll see also here is that more than 50%, the, the lower two parts, they've been through European processes. So the European processes within San and Sandak. And this shows, of course, why this is so important to us. Uh, the European system is in such an important part of this broader international system. And critically, this, uh, this whole national collection of standards is a co coherent catalogue. The key principle is that we have standards that are not conflicting. We may have adopted an international standard, but, but that doesn't conflict with another British standard on the same subject. We look to, to adopt the international standard and make sure there is no other standard because this is the way in which we work. We have national committees uh, giving their expert input, as many of you do, giving their expert input to the development of standards, and they want to see one standard used everywhere, whatever the origin is, whatever its origin. They, they look for an international standard, but we'll develop one standard, or whatever we're doing. Uh, and, and these standards aren't developed by standards bodies, and uh, they've been a couple of questions along this line today. They're not developed by us in BSI. We're not sitting around the table with other standards bodies saying what, what is the right thing for, for this or that. It's our stakeholders are our stakeholder experts who are the ones who are developing the standards for us. We help them uh, to, to, to do that by providing the structure, providing the committee structure and the, the interfaces with the, the international and European processes such that our UK experts can influence the contents of the, the international standards that we're used. And uh, with apologies to the, the international audience, we're very successful at this in, in the UK. Countries are, of course, we're very successful. We can say that uh, there are more uh, participating 
ISO members come from the UK than from any other country. We can say also that some of the, the most uh, well-used standards around the world uh, started their life as British standards, quality management, environmental management systems, uh, information security, business continuity, things like that. We, we're, we're very successful at this in the UK. We have an international catalogue, uh, uh, and, and that's what we're looking for, an international catalogue wherever we can with, with the UK influence in the, in the process. So stepping back from the, the context to, to the question of, of EU exit, um, as many of you are aware, we've been working since the referendum uh, with the other members of, of Senate and like to see with them what the future is of, of BSI within the, 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 the organisations on behalf of the UK in these private member bodies. Uh, and where, where, we, where we got to back in uh, late 2018 was a decision in the General Assemblies of, of Senate Sandlack that uh, come the point of EU exit, so back in February this year, um, then BSI continues as a Senate Sandlack member. Uh, we continue to adopt all European standards, to withdraw any conflicting national standards, to follow the rules of standstill. We enter into a transition period for the Sen and Senlac statutes. Transition period is, is a, uh, a phrase that's used in the political arena for Brexit, but it's also a phrase used for the, for the Sen and Senlac statutes. We need to work with the other members to, to amend the statutes of those organisations such that there cannot be a challenge to the like, to come out of the Senate to the European standards, and such that there cannot be a challenge to BSI's membership within the organisations. That's that's what we're working towards, and for that reason, we have we've created this transition period together with the other members, so that we can um, work through all of the questions about what uh, what what the future relationship and the future status of BSI within the Senate will be. Now, more recently, there have been develop, development in, in, in this, and the first is that um, the, there is a proposal that the UK voting uh, within within San Selec will move from the uh, EEA to the non-EEA category from the 1st of July. This is a proposal. It will be decided at the General Assemblies in June. That doesn't mean no voting. It doesn't mean no weighted voting. The weighting is the same, but uh, should a European standard not be voted Successfully uh, on a first count, then a second count is carried out without the non-EEA countries, uh, and if it's successful, then, then it's adopted the European standard. And so this is this is just a means uh, to 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 make sure that harmonisation within standards can continue um, within those the EEA countries if they so wish, uh, and, and without uh, uh, without necessarily. Uh, hearing the, the vote of the non-EEA countries. The second change um, is that the transition period which is due to end at the end of this year is proposed to end at the end of 2021, which reflects the fact that the political relationships are still developing and uh, the members are still discussing the way in which uh, BSI's membership will continue uh, at, at the end of this year. So that will move forward then for one more year. It gives us a bit more time to come up with the right solution for all of the members and for the, uh, the standard system in, in which we work. So that's uh, where we are with Send the Send Like membership. Uh, turning now to the, um, uh, the, the, the political and the regulatory position, um, we are currently in the, the EU exit transition period, the transition period for the UK as a whole, uh, during which um, all EU law applies, uh, including those laws that are supported by standards. So those are uh, the, the, the legislation under the what we call the NLF, the new legislative framework, with which many of you will be familiar. It is, it is a method of EU regulatory harmonisation, whereby the uh, regulatory requirements are generally limited to a higher level essential requirement, such as must be must be safe, it must have X performance or Y performance, and the details of that are then given by standards uh, which are developed in support of the regulation. Uh, much of the content of the standard will support compliance with the regulation. Um, and then those st standards are recognised within the EU system, recognised by the European Commission for this purpose. So those, the same European standards will continue to support the NLF regulations uh, as part of EU law, uh, sorry, as part of 
UK law as we go through the rest of this year. And where products are uh, conformed to harmonised standards that are cited in the official journal, they will maintain their, they will still confer a presumption of conformity on of the product uh, with the regulation. So, the, in other words, we're in the same position as, as the UK has been up until up, up until uh, leaving the EU, but without the uh, the specific say within the uh, within EU bodies. Things have moved on, though, uh, in in um, in terms of UK government policy um, since the 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 referendum and the the uh, uh, the. We had the, the government of Theresa May, and the government of Theresa May took a, an approach to uh, EU exit, which was to try to, to maximise the, the linkages with EU regulation, at least in certain areas such as such as product uh, product harmonisation. The Johnson government has taken a very different position, and the Johnson government position has been based upon a very clear statement that the, there will be no automatic regulatory alignment with the EU and certainly no uh, European Court of Justice oversight of, of UK law. And for that reason, the Johnson government is seeking a free trade agreement with, with the EU, uh, a, a less tight relationship than was possibly seen in, in, in the May government. So this, this means, of course, the UK will have absolute freedom to diverge from, from EU regulation. That's the position of, the, of this, this government and what they're, what they're looking for. Uh, I was asked this question earlier, Today as well, when the Johnson government requests an extension to the transition period, uh, the government's position uh, has been and remains absolutely clear that they will not uh, be requesting an extension to the transition period. That is the official line, the only line that, that, that we've that we've heard clearly. There are rumours. We hear rumours that that uh, the extension may be requested, but we have heard nothing from the government to say that that, that would be the case, and that the government line remains remains absolutely solid. Um, we were we were meant to see what what happens. Um, the, uh, the there is until the end of June, I believe, to, to request an extension. Um, when that's the case, we we will see. So we we don't know more about that at, at the moment. But that's the the Johnson government position. Different to the Theresa May government position, a position of non automatic alignment and freedom to diverge, uh, which is, which is quite which is a significant change. The EU, of course, has, has heard this. Uh, the EU recognises that that the that the UK has, has left the EU and becomes a third country, became a third country as of the first of February. And being a third country without um, the uh, an agreement for alignment that you may have that they have with uh, with the European Economic Area, with uh, with Switzerland, or even with Turkey, the, the EU position and Michel Barnier's team has said to us very clearly that. Um, the, the the UK is like uh, is not like Switzerland or like Turkey. The UK is like South Korea, is a third country at, at, at some at some remove from the uh, from EU public policy. So that means no decision making powers. Of course, the decision making powers are reserved for the EU member states. It also means no decision shaping powers, and decision shaping powers uh, are held by. Um, uh, by Norway, by Switzerland, by Turkey, they're involved in uh, committees and groups that, that work on the development of policy at, at early stages, while they don't work on the decision-making part. They work on that, that policy shaping early on. What's clear is that that a uh, free trade agreement along the lines of, of the proposal from the government doesn't permit that, it certainly doesn't permit that uh, at, at the start, uh, post-transition uh, period. I put a note in here about the the James Elliott case. Again, a number of you will be uh, familiar with the with the James Elliott case. Uh, it's it's a European Court of Justice case um, concerning construction products directive uh, based on uh, coming from from Ireland, and it says that that standards uh, standards linking to regulation are part of EU law, certainly in as far as they have a illegal effect, such as a presumption of conformity. Uh, and this this means, of course, if we're talking about decision making or decision shaping powers, there, there is a question mark about how that links to standards and what that means. Now, the, the interpretation of the James Elliott case isn't entirely accepted. There are certain EU member states that argue against the uh, extent of the interpretation placed on on this case by the European Commission. 
But nevertheless, the, the, this is important context to bear in mind when we talk about what the political angles are for, uh, for the UK's involvement in European standards uh, post-transition. So, at the moment, uh, the UK and EU are negotiating the, the future relationship based on this concept of a, of a, of a free trade agreement. Uh, and, and what the UK is looking for is, is, is no tariffs on goods or other, other restrictions. They're looking for a reduction in, in, in trade barriers, some sort of regulatory cooperation. They're looking to make sure nothing is in the agreement requires regulatory alignment. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean regulatory divergence, but no regulatory, automatic regulatory alignment. But at the same time, they're looking for mutual recognition of testing, of conformity assessments. Um, both the UK and the EU are looking for a definition of international standards, which is, which is good, uh, which certainly BSI would support. The, uh, the definitions they're looking at are, are slightly different, but, but I don't think they're, it, this is an insurmountable, uh, insurmountable um, issue here. Um, we would say, though, that the, the, the sort of agreement being negotiated, the free trade agreement that, that's being negotiated, will, is unlikely to cover the, um, the, the detail of the NLF regulation, the Universal Framework Regulation. These are regulations um, such as electrical equipment, and medical devices, machinery, gas appliances, uh, um, pyrotechnics, uh, and various other things. And, and that's unlikely to be covered within this within the the agreement that comes out, which is quite significant. From our side, uh, we we're talking to the to uh, the Department for Business and the Department for International Trade. Uh, in relation to this agreement, we're talking particularly to the Department for Business, also to the UK mission uh, to the EU in Brussels, um, to, to give information about uh, the, the role of standards in an agreement and where we see that, that, that playing a part. We're, of course, seeking an outcome based on the continued use of uh, common standards for market access, continued voluntary use, uh, supporting regulation, uh, but also just normal business to business use uh, in the same way Scott mentioned earlier in the Q&A. That, that's, that would be our main objective along with a, a, a clear and supportive definition of, of international standards that, uh, that uh, enables uh, us to work within the, within the ISO and IOC system in the way now. So the, the, uh, the, those negotiations, the negotiations are ongoing. We understand that they're continuing to work even during the the lockdown periods in the, in the UK and, and, and Belgium, and there are virtual meetings that are, are, are happening. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to make sure that, that should standards uh, come up, uh, that we are available to, uh, to support the, the UK, UK negotiators in, in putting out the importance of the, the common set of standards that we already have, how they work with market access, and how they work with regulation. So, I talked about um, the the fact that it's unlikely that this uh, that the free trade agreement will cover the the NLF regulation. Um, that, as I said, is important. Uh, so, at the end of this transition period, in uh, it come come the, the end of this year, January, uh, we we're assuming that for the for the purposes of this uh, session that that the the uh, any agreed FTA doesn't cover or amend the NLF regulation to any great extent. And we're assuming at this point also that government doesn't change existing uh, statutory instruments in the UK um, before the end of the transition. If we can make those assumptions, uh, and, and of course, uh, and I know that we have uh, uh, government people on the on the call who, who may be able to, uh, who, who may, may uh, have, have views about whether government will or will not change regulations in the meantime. Um, but assuming that, that these things these things are the case, then where we are is that from the end of the, the transition period, then the European Union withdrawal act will remove the linkages to EU law within the, the, the uh, within the, the NLF regulations that we have that we have now. Those regulations, those directives and regulations, their essential requirements and the the, the provision for presumption and conformity will continue identically, but they'll continue without the linkage. In, into the European Commission, or if uh, the, the linkage comes in, or indeed if there were their regulations, they will be onshored as, as UK regulation rather than being directly applicable regulation. 
because some of these regulations would not work properly without without amendments, there are statute, statutory instruments on the UK statute book already enacted and waiting for the end of the, the transition period uh, to come into effect. These statutory instruments make the necessary changes to those uh, NLF regulations and directives such that they can work as UK only legal text. And these, these are very important because obviously EU regulation makes a great deal of references to uh, what the Commission does, what member states may do, to the creation of committees, the running of comitology procedures, to decision making. All of those things need to be amended into a UK only uh, legal order. And that's what these statutory instruments uh, UK government expended a huge amount of time getting these ready. They were prepared for a no deal exit last year. They've been prepared and they are ready to bring in to the UK law, or rather continue in the UK law, all of those those statutory instruments that we're talking about here for relevant standards uh, in a way that they make the minimum possible uh, changes. Uh, and the only changes are for, for amending or, or preventing any inoperabilities. So the NLF, uh, NLF directives and regulations and essential requirements will be the same, as I say, and the use of standards for regulatory compliance will still be the same, will still be voluntary, um, and, and we will move in to January to the situation where we have exactly the same legal requirements, but without the linkage to the EU. Um, at the same time, the Northern Ireland Protocol will take full effect at that point, uh, uh, and that this this gives rise to quite a complex situation, which we are still uh, looking to, to work out, uh, and we're, we're in conversations with UK government about how this works. Northern Ireland being part of the, the UK Customs Union, but applying EU tariffs to goods that, that are going to be exported to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, EU regulation applying in, in that same situation, but also uh, UK regulation applying when products are, are sent through to the rest of the UK. Um, we note that for CE marking purposes, Northern Ireland can't have EU, EU notified bodies because it's not, it's not an EU member state. Um, but some of those questions around, uh, around certificates and so on, there is a level of recognition that we're still working through with, with Bayes, our understanding of how this, how this all sits. Together. We're also, of course, thinking about um, the, the standards that, it, that uh, are used within Northern Ireland because it's part of UK, UK territory. There are standards within our common set of, of British standards. We, of course, want to have a, a as I said already, a consistent, non-conflicting set of standards. How does that work when you have this, this different regulatory difference within Northern Ireland? Well, the, the, as Scott mentioned earlier, there is some, some wriggle room within the system, uh, but, but what we're looking for is to say we have a common set of standards, we use that right across the board. So I, I've said that the NLF legislation will still be in force. Uh, this again, of course, when, when in the default position where that hasn't been changed and government hasn't made significant changes in the meantime. The legislation will still be enforced. The essential requirements will be the same. But there are some changes being made to the NLF regulations and, and directives that are of, of significance to, to standards. Uh, and in particular, it's around the, the, the role of harmonised European standards and how that's translated into a UK legal order. And the way that's done on the, on the whole, and I note that, that it's not necessarily the case for medical devices, but on the whole, is that harmonised standards are replaced by a, uh, a the, the concept of designated standards, where the uh, Secretary of State, the relevant Secretary of State, will designate a standard in, in put that in listed uh, somewhere to say that this standard provides presumption of conformity with UK regulation, and that mirrors the, in a way the, the way in which the, the process works. At the same time, uh, notified bodies will be re re replaced with approved bodies. And CE marking will be replaced by a UK CA marking for the UK market only. And many of you will be will be familiar with uh, with these these terms and the and the concepts and, and looking to to see how to how to prepare for that. Um, in addition, though, we'll, we'll, although this UK CA marking uh, will be the UK marking as of as of the first of January, CE marking will continue to be recognised for an as yet undefined uh, temporary period. Um, and then that, that will be stopped at some point by the relevant Secretary of State in, in the particular area. 
but there will be a, a, a continuation but there will be changes to the regulation that will need, need new processes and so on i'll come to talk about what those processes are in a, in a, in a little while in terms of our position, Scott uh, spoke about this, this this earlier as well in the in the Q and A. Uh, our role, of course, as national standards body, is to serve the needs of our of, of our stakeholders, our UK stakeholders, give them the standards developing framework that they need to trade here in the UK and to trade globally, including including with within Europe. It's very important, of course, as part of that, uh, and as part of our role as uh, as part of serving stakeholder needs. And as part of our role as a national standards body, that we are able to respond to UK government policy, to give necessary mechanisms to coordinate and, and respond to the coordination of the government's need for, for standards. And so our, our uh, role needs to evolve as the political positions uh, evolve as well. We recognise that the Johnson government position makes a change to uh, the, the way in which it, it's looking at uh, regulatory. Uh, uh, regular, reg, regulatory linkages to the EU. So we need to be able, as national standards body, to support the UK's autonomous regulatory policy post transition and support that as it develops. And some of that may well be, and there's, there's a strong likelihood, that there will be in due course regulation that is different from that of the EU, which may, in certain circumstances, also necessitate. The use of standards that are different to those used uh, within the European standard system. We need to be prepared for that and to be in a position to answer to our UK stakeholders, including UK government, and to enable the, the, the access for UK business in the, in the home market. At the same time, we're still absolutely committed to promoting UK stakeholder leadership and working within the international standard system. Because our standard system is based around the use of a single standard uh, used wherever possible, and that's the, and and to the the use of of uh, that single standard within also within the regional European system. Uh, so we're committed to international first. We're committed to the European system, and um, we need to work with our colleagues within the Senate membership to understand together how. The, the politics moving forward enables us to still work in, in with a with a body of common standards uh, through, throughout our, our system. So I, I'll talk in the in the final part of of, of my bit of this uh, session. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the, the first element of how um, BSI will support. Uh, UK government policy post transition, and and one part of that is about regulatory policy, and the next part of that is about trade policy. When when Frank will talk to you, um, in the uh, in the, the 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 first part, I've I've talked about uh, the onshoring of NLF regulations and, and directives, uh, and then that creates a, a a relationship between standards and regulations in in, in UK only law. Uh, and what we will have uh, in the start of next year is some 3,200 or so British standards providing presumption of conformity with UK legal requirements. And that needs to be managed uh, by UK government and by BSI with, through an interface. Of course, this is an opportunity for UK government to create uh, new aspects to its regulatory policy, to create mechanisms that, it, that enable it to administer this this legislation in a good and effective and efficient way, uh, and and it, and we play a part in in BSI in that, and indeed you, those of you who are involved in standards development, will certainly play a part in that as well, because I think there will be a greater focus on the on the, the BSI national committees and their work in relation to regulating compliance in the UK. More specifically. Um, where we are now is talking to Department for Business, but also talking to, to other government departments, um, for example, uh, Ministry of Housing, about what this interface is, uh, what it needs to be between standards and regulations, between the, the standard system and the, the public policy post-EU transition, and how a, a system will work for designating standards. So as I've said before, designation by the relevant 50 states and in the, in the particular departments, but we need to see how we're going to work with them to uh, to make sure that 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 they that they have 
the information they need to make the decisions about designation, the information they need to see which standards are coming through the system, where decisions need to be taken on, on designation. Um, and so that, that, that's what we, we have to do. We are working uh, with the Department of Business, talking to them about the sort of information and workflows that we can create to help them uh, in their work, to make sure that they have the right, right information at the right time, things that are, that are coming through the system, new standards, and maybe even new regulatory development in the EU, how that sits with what's going on here. And we have to see what sort of process for the assessment of, uh, of standards that, that, that we need uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of regulatory compliance. The, uh, the National Committee, as I say, may well play an increased role here. So those of you who work in our National Committees on Harmonised Standards will certainly be talking to you about that in due course. But I see your, 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 I see your picture. I see, are you wanting to, to add in at this point? No, I was thinking you're doing extremely well, actually, and I was enjoying <laughs> it. And I, I had to pop out to go to a CBI conference, but I'm back now. OK, great, great, great. OK, well, we'll, we'll come back to you in due course then. So I, uh, I think that's um, that's it for, for me. Uh, Frank, I'm going to I'm going to turn to you now. I think is that correct? In, indeed, Richard, it is. Thank you. Um, I'll, just, we, I'll just close this down and and, and actually, read. Richard, if I could ask you to to keep it up just for now. Um, yeah. I, I'm I'm having a little bit of a connectivity issues between my monitors. No so problem. I, if if you could um, if you could. You let you let me know when you want, want me to move if I don't work going, it out. That would be that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Richard. Um, so yes, uh, we we've heard about um, we've heard about the 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 impact of of um, of EU exit on uh, on the regulatory system and how that may um, how, how that may have an influence on 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 the way we use standards here in the UK after the transition period. Um, and we've also heard about um, how uh, BSI will be looking to work with government in that context um, and com communicate uh, the needs of our stakeholders when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to the future use of standards to support regulation in the UK. Um, part of that obviously um, relates, to, uh, relates to trade policy and to the effect that um, trade, uh, trade policy and trade agreements may have um, uh, may have in the UK after the uh, after the transition period. What I I think why it's timely to talk about this now is you, you know there's there's two main um, two main aspects. One of course is the uh, the regulatory changes of, of, of Brexit, uh, but others are wider global trends which uh, are um, which play a role in uh, in how standards will be perceived internationally, um, and that's that, you know that's thrown up through this the current uh, the current COVID nineteen emergency, and how different countries are reacting to to that, and how supply chains may be affected in the in the med in the short to medium term as 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 um, a countries emerge from this from this crisis, but also broader trends, so ch technological change the move towards services trade all this has an implication on the on the way that standards um the way that standards interact with uh with with trade so um a quick quick structure to this this my part of the presentation a quick look at the uh, how international standards are um are referred to within the wto system so the the main the main uh, reference point for for international standards uh, is indeed the the WTO TBT agreement. That's the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement that was um, that was uh, drawn up when the WTO was founded in in 1995. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the place of international standards within within that TBT agreement. Then I'll move on to look at how uh, since the referendum and since the the prospect of an independent UK trade policy has become uh, has has come into sight. How BSI, with with the support of our stakeholders, ha, has has begun to look at um, look at the priorities for, for for us when it comes to um, emerging UK trade policy. So our role within the WTO, and indeed with um, particular bilateral trade agreements. So we we hear a lot about um, new trade agreements with countries such as the uh, the US um, and you know other trading partners, Australia, New Zealand, CPTPP. 
uh, you know, obviously this has, uh, obviously those trading partners have their interests when it comes to, to standards. So we are looking at how best we can maximize the influence of, of our stakeholders within those new uh, trade agreements. Um, I'll go on to look at how we've been engaging with government and um, a, a little, perhaps a sneak preview into some of the work we are looking to do uh, within BSI as to how we can really work in the most efficient way of, of channeling expertise to government within the um, development of trade policy and um, equally as, as trade agreements are negotiated, but also how we can um, help our stakeholders understand better understand the um, the opportunities for standardization that may come through uh, through future trade policy in the UK and trade agreements so I think that that sort of links on to the fourth point here how we how we look to um, involve our stakeholders and what we need from you in terms of input when it comes to um, you know our armory of information of, of, of the experiences, the case studies that you have, whether it's market access issues um, or, or indeed um, if, you're, if your main focus is the UK, looking at how, um, um, how uh, other standards used globally may uh, have an impact on, on your work. Um, so um, Richard, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So um, uh, yes, and a quick look at the uh, the the WTO and the TBT agreement. Um, so again, the TBT agreement was um, was um, uh, developed uh, drafted in 1995 when the WTO was founded. And what it says um, for goods is that um, uh, WTO WTO members should look to base their technical regulations on international standards where they exist. And this is quite a precise instruction. This is, this is not a, you know, it, it's a good idea to, uh, it's a, it is a shall. You shall, or member states or, of the WTO shall base their technical regulation on international standards. But what is more confusing, uh, what, is, what isn't clear within that is, the, um, is what is the definition of international standard. Now, most parts of the world would tend to interpret international standard as one developed through the recognized international standards organizations of, of ISO and IEC. There are others, but ICO, ISO and IEC uh, in primarily uh, are those organizations. Other partners or other trading um, uh, partners of the UK don't um, use that uh, interpretation. They have a different view that, that an international standard could be um, any standard which, um, which meets certain criteria of inclusiveness in, in its development. So, so we have on the one part, an instruction to use international standards to base regulation on at the WTO level, but no agreed definition of what that, of what international standard should mean. So the, the, the compromise that, is, that, that was developed within the WTO system was these um, uh, commonly agreed principles on, on, um, on the development and the implementation of standards and those became what's called the six principles of, 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 um, of standards development that all uh, WTO members sign up to. Um, and those are around transparency in the, in the standards development process, openness to a wide range of stakeholders and impartiality um, and consensus based standards development. So those are a few of the principles that have been, um, have been uh, developed at WTO level. Uh, so why is this relevant to our discussion? Well, as we um, negotiate new trade agreements, the definition of what is an international standard will become uh, important when we look at um, uh, agreeing together on um, the, the TBT chapter of any trade agreement and on the basis of which um, we should uh, base our, um, or the exact basis upon which we should base our um, interpretation of international standard for the purposes of a trade agreement with uh, a, a, new, a new trading partner. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. So moving on then to um, some principles of, of, of BSI's position on trade policy, I have to stress again at this point that this doesn't come from, 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 from this, this doesn't come from nowhere. This has been developed over time 
in consultation with um, all our stakeholders, uh, our standards makers, and um, has really been uh, in a process of gestation since the referendum in 2016. We've 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 uh, matured this position now into into one that we is we we consider to be one that we um, are happy to um, to uh, share with government and to um, and to advocate for. So our prime, I think, the the overriding um, concern in in when it when it comes to trade agreements uh, is the use of uh, of international standards to um, as a as a basis for those agreements as a basis for trade. And I think it's been stressed all throughout the day that um, you know, international standards are a passport to trade for um, uh, globally. They simplify market access. But they're also an area where the UK has um, a high degree of leadership. Uh, so if you look at ISO and IEC, or ISO in particular, the UK has more participating members in technical committees at ISO level than any other country. So that already shows you the, the degree of leadership that the UK has within, within one um, major international standards organisation. So in looking to... Um, in looking to conclude trade agreements, we should be looking to base those on international standards where the UK is uh, traditionally strong. Um, moving, moving on to the second point, so, and then coming back to what I mentioned before about this definition of international standard, we, we believe we should be defining international standard in a way that promotes UK interests. And how do you promote UK interests uh, when it comes to the definition of international standard? Well, that's by referencing the, the international organisations of ISO and IEC, where the UK has strong leadership. And I have to also um, add at this point that, you know, when we talk about international standards, we also mean the European regional standards, where we um, also play a very important role. So those are the two uh, first two points. The third point would be to avoid the mutual recognition uh, of standards. Why is this a problem? Well, where countries um, use standards that come from or adopt standards that come from outside the international system, um, and that's primarily the case in, uh, in, in, in one major trading partner of the UK, the US, where the US involvement in the international system is perhaps less than, than, than some other countries. Um, the, um, the, the risk in the UK recognising um, American standards adopted outside this international system for the purposes of regulatory compliance is that you would have um, the, the, the power that our, um, that our stakeholders have in the UK um, to, uh, to influence the content of, of British standards um, would be diminished through that um, through uh, that act. So we're very keen to avoid the the mutual recognition of standards, which would also add confusion to the marketplace, and would lead to the regulator taking a very old-fashioned or having to take a very old-fashioned approach, or which they do in the US currently, which is to choose themselves the standards that that, that would apply in regulation through a process called incorporation by reference. So, it's a, so we're keen to avoid a, 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 um, a reverting to, um, to uh, inefficient means of, 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 of regulatory approaches involving standards uh, and regulation and maintaining the international system, which is one where the UK has leadership and is known by its stakeholders. So moving on, um, our view would be that working with trading partners, the, the, the priority should be agreeing um, on international standards uh, where they exist. So in, in, in areas of emerging technology, working together to develop international standards. That's a way of boosting competitiveness of both trading partners. But where that isn't possible to work together bilaterally on, 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 on new standards. But what we have to avoid is this sort of duplication of standards that would come through working outside the international system. And then finally, to make full use of the expertise that's there within our experts and, and, and standards makers. Um, so uh, the latest figures I hear, we're approaching 13,000 standards makers in the UK. And we are looking to how best we can, we can funnel that expertise, how we can leverage that expertise for the purposes of, of, of um, 
getting the best result for, for our stakeholders from trade agreements. Next slide, please. Um, so a, a quick look at what, what BSI has been doing since, um, you know, obviously since uh, Boris Johnson became prime minister, um, there's been a change in, in, in the emphasis of, 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 of UK policy and Richard alluded, alluded to it earlier when he, when he talked about the, the move away from this talk of, of, the, of, the, of the common playbook with the EU and, the, and looking at some degree of continued regulatory alignment towards something much more um, uh, akin to a, a, a fully autonomous regulatory uh, framework. Um, and so we've taken that change of government policy on board and we've looked at all times to, to stress the importance of maintaining UK leadership in the international standards um, community. And um, that's been very much at the forefront of our messaging um, since, since that change of government. Um, so we've, we've done a number of things. And I think we've engaged across the board, really. We've, we've gone to the, the, the high level um, meetings with, with ministers um, and letters to the secretary, secretaries of state in various government departments. Um, but we've also looked to embed um, BSI and our stakeholder views at, at, at different levels. So Scott uh, is, um, sits on our strategic trade advisory group. So looking, to, looking more into the, um, the strategic um, implications of, 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 of trade agreements. And uh, finally, we've been um, on a more day-to-day -day level, we've been working very closely with the regulatory environment team within the Department of International Trade, making sure that they're aware of our concerns when it comes to, uh, when it comes to trade agreements. Of course, DIT being responsible for the trade negotiations with the US, um, Cabinet Office uh, very much um, leading on the negotiations with the EU, which, uh, which Richard detailed earlier. Next slide, please, Richard. So what has this delivered? What have we, um, what have we got from, from this process? And I think two key documents that we've, we've uh, published, uh, one being our position paper on international standards. We presented it at our last meeting um, back, in, back in November. We had a really interesting panel discussion uh, at the time on the um, on issues linked to uh, linked to international standards and also the role the continued role of BSI within the European system um, that was very much a, a key part to that discussion was the continued influence of our stakeholders in European regional standards and um, the the second being the um, a, 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 what I think is perhaps a more significant um, document that we've um, we've drawn up with support of a, a large number of our stakeholders um, uh, I think Richard um, Richard pointed that out in our um, in our um, market stall session earlier today the um, the role of our stakeholders in supporting our position it's always been you know key to key to us to have that to have that support and when we drew up the original brexit position paper in 2018, the, the role of our stakeholders in support was, was key. And here again, we, we see um, our stakeholders rallying around um, for, a, um, for our position on, um, on the role of international standards um, for, for the UK as a, as a trading nation. And, when, and, and some of the key recommendations of that stakeholder statement, so, so we're, we're talking stakeholders across the board, not just from business, um, also consumers, uh, and, um, and market surveillance authority, so the um, so um, trading standards, uh, a, a very um, a very widely supported paper, and our message to, to government government being very much involve um, the breadth of UK expertise in the negotiation of of, uh, of trade agreements, and in particular when it comes to standards, to involve uh, BSI as the as a national standards body. Um, so those are two key uh, key papers that we've uh, that we've delivered in support of our engagement with government. So what are we looking to do in future? Um, on the one hand, uh, so two 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 main areas as we look to sort of develop our ability to respond to to government policy uh, on, on on trade and also the negotiation of, uh, of new trade agreements. So we, we need to be uh, able to provide um, 
uh, expertise in a timely manner to government when it comes to the negotiation of, of trade agreements. Those requests for information, requests for, 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 for expertise on specific technical matters will come quickly. We need to be in a position to, to, to respond. So we're working internally with colleagues and also with, um, with our stakeholders on how we can best um, uh, give support to our to our um, to the pledges that we've made within our within our um, uh, our stakeholder paper and um, and deliver uh, deliver recommendations and expertise to government as trade agreements come through the pipeline. So that's that's one area we're looking to to uh, to build one area of of, of expertise and, and capacity, and another will be um, in the um, in funneling or, or, or channeling knowledge. Um, that we build around trade, trade agreements, market access issues, use of standards around the world for the benefit of our stakeholders here in the UK. So those are two um, principal aspects of our um, of, of this trade policy function that we're in the process of developing. And I think it's very important that as we develop that, we um, next slide, please, Richard. Sorry, um, that we look to um, we look for your involvement. And I've just um, you know. Maybe this, maybe this presentation, maybe some parts of what Richard have said, had said earlier will have triggered some some uh, concerns, questions in your mind, and of course we'll discuss them in the in the question and answer session afterwards. Um, but uh, key questions, I think, linked to um, market access. We talked about uh, you know how standards give market access. We we are we are very interested in hearing your your experiences for those of you who export what have been your um what have been your main concerns in 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 uh, exporting where how do standards provide market access where are the barriers when it comes to using standards and we hear examples all the time of of trade barriers through standards um what would be your main priorities or concerns for trade agreements i appreciate here that it's we're not just looking for the view of business we, we also have consumers um, and regulators and academics within within our community of stakeholders. So obviously not not just business, but but others as well. W what are your main concerns when it comes to trade agreements? We would be very very um, uh, grateful for that knowledge because um, that will help build our um, the strength, if you like, of our arguments when it comes to to speaking to government. And, and finally, what um, what opportunities in what specific opportunities within standards do, do you see for the UK um, in perhaps emerging areas of tech? To give to give one example, autonomous vehicles. Where where do you think where do you think those future opportunities will come from? And um, so all this to have that knowledge will be would be extremely extremely useful for you as we take forward this this trade policy function. And I think I'll end it there. Uh, many thanks. Thanks, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we we just to conclude now before we open to, to questions. Uh, just summarising where 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 we are. Uh, Frank has talked about about trade policy and uh, the the what we're looking to do within 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 BSI creating a trade policy function, supporting uh, government in its negotiations, trying to seek to to help government to get the the, the best outcomes for for the UK and in, in trade policy and. and the, these. Uh, and of course we engage with you as our stakeholders to to help us with that to identify market access barriers to identify market priorities and and so on all of this being based on the the importance of uh, international standards to the, to the uk and the importance of our involvement in the development of international standards including within that i see this is coming in some of the questions including within that within the european regional component I, I talked about uh, where we are with the EU transition, what happens at the end of, end of transition when the, the NLF regulations and directives are onshored, um, and then the UK government will be using designated standards that, that will be designating standards that then businesses will use to, to show that how they meet, uh, meet the UK regulations. Uh, and we'll, we'll enable that, we'll work with government, we've already started working with government to see how how that uh, processes will how those processes will run to create the necessary interfaces and, and make that work in a smooth and efficient way. 
of course, in relation to our, our, our own uh, role as national standards body post-transition, we will support the UK government uh, uh, regulatory policy in, in the way that the way that we always always have done, uh, with an additional note that there may be some extra uh, regulatory requirements in, in, that, that relate in some way to standards. But this will not stop us uh, pushing for a coherent, non-conflicting national catalogue of standards based upon international standards, including the European standards of, of Turner and Denmark. So uh, that's that's where we are. Thank you very much for your attention for, for, for that, all uh, 170 or so of you. Uh, we've got a number of questions that come in. I'll, I'll close the presentation because otherwise I tend to uh, um, uh, move it backwards and forwards by mistake, but I'll close this and, and then we'll move to some of these, some of the questions here. Um, I'll, so I don't believe that at, at the moment that you can um, you can see the questions, and so I will put a couple of them up. There are ones from uh, Adrian Wyatt about. Um, I'll start with there's a couple of, on regulation. There's one from Adrian Wyatt about virt virtual parliament about a bottom at MDR. So uh, Adrian's question about uh, I was I was talking about. Uh, whether UK government would do anything between now and end of transition to um, uh, amend the uh, the legislation that is that is in that is in place, this is a question about what government could do or could not do in relation to um, changing uh, changing the, the the extension transition. Well, I, I I can't answer the question unfortunately, Adrian. Do it just to say that you know, this is this is a question for government about what processes they need to go through to. To uh, work to, to uh, determine whether they, they want to ask for extension or not. That's a that's a government issue, not rather than for us. Uh, Dave Bottom's question on the MDR medical device regulation. Um, Frank, we were talking about this the uh, the other week about the the um, use of armament standards for medical device regulation, uh, but the possibility of creating these common specifications. <laughs> Excuse me. I, um, this is not entirely new, is it? It has it has precedent, I believe, in in some of the medical regulation, uh, and it's it's not seen. Uh, certainly, my conversations with people who worked in in European trade associations back uh, uh, probably three four years ago uh, was that this wasn't seen as, as a replacement for harmonised standards. It was when there were certain circumstances where it wasn't possible to develop a harmonised standard, and some other specification would be created instead. So it's not been seen as a as a threat as, as from what I'm aware, I'm, I'm no no expert. I think, are, we, are we best to take this question back to our, uh, our people who work on medical devices, and then then uh, talk to Dave off, offline about it? I think I think so, Richard. I, all all I all I know on the common specifications uh, issue is that they they did exist before, but they were broadened quite considerably in the in the last uh, in the in the reg, in the regulation when when the directive was change to a regulation so um mm -hmm. that, I, I but i think it's best that we we take that offline and um we get a more detailed answer to dave okay okay so we'll try we'll try our best to do that uh, uh adrian white had, had questions about um uh the differing arrangements in northern ireland gibraltar channel islands and and others and i think um there was a similar one uh, about northern ireland creating its own standards body possibly doing something to involve the standards body. Well, yes, there, there are there are different um, different aspects, different jurisdictions. That that's not only for us; that's for other countries as well in in, in similar positions. You know, we, Scott mentioned in the in the Q and A earlier the, the example of of the building regulations, where we have different building regulations in in England and in Scotland and and in Wales. We have one set of standards that we use for those those business regu building regulations and that's absolutely supported by by business in those areas whether whether you 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 look at the isle of man or or guernsey or or greater london or gibraltar they're not necessarily going to want separate standards for things that are that are specific to them uh, our, our feeling talking to our stakeholders which we've done consistently since the referendum is that what they want is a common set of standards a common set of international standards also used in, in Europe uh, as European standards were impossible, uh, and, and for that common set to be influenced by, by them as, as UK business. And 
the, the businesses who've, who've worked on developing the European standards over the last 20 or so years and I'm generally very pleased with where they've got to. They felt that they, they've influenced these standards. They've got them into ISO wherever they can. They're used, guaranteed across the 34 countries within, within, uh, within Europe. So why would they look to have different standards at, at this point? So I don't think this is a question of trying to break it down into ever smaller blocks of, of standards development. That doesn't really serve the purpose of having a standard. The purpose of having a standard is about interoperability and trade and, and market access wherever you go. What we need to do is to try to um, try to make sure that the standard serves the needs of all, all the people and, and get those people involved where, wherever they can and where, wherever, wherever they're, they're interested. And so I think that that's the same question for, for this more specific one on Northern Ireland. I don't think we need to have a separate standards body for Northern Ireland. Where we are is that we have a common set of standards uh, for, for us and with, um, and with the Republic. I don't think that people in Northern Ireland would say, well, we want to have Northern Irish standards for, for this or that or the other, what they want to say is that they want e the easiest possible market access through, through regulation and for the regulatory position to be as clear as possible, which is obviously quite challenging, but supported by a, a single common set of standards uh, doing the job uh, uh, in day-to-day -day market access for the business, business transactions. My, my view would be that we're not looking we're not looking to break it down into smaller blocks. What we're looking to do is to try to focus on having international standards, making sure they're adopted nationally, as we do within the European system, developing extra standards if we really need them within, within Europe, but keeping that together rather than breaking it apart. Because that's, that's the way that we enable, enable business better. Indeed, at the same time, I should have mentioned, that's also, of course, the way in which consumers and other stakeholders with less broad reach get, get involved more easily because they get get involved more easily when there's a single process that they're, that they're working through. Um, there was a question from Paul Hyde um, uh, on a, a similar one. And Scott, would you like to take that one? I think the, that one's visible. Is there, a, is there a conflict of interest risk if PSI remains a full member of Sunlink and at the same time is directed by UK government to develop UK specific standards that diverge from Sunlink? Surely BSI could not be in both camps as Central membership compels us to adopt the agreed standard. Yeah, it's a great question, Paul. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was busy answering a couple of other calls as fast as I could type. Um, <laughs> is there a conflict of interest? No, no there is no conflict of interest. Um, what we are uh, seeking to do is to represent the views of UK stakeholders, consumers, industry, and indeed regulators to, to, to provide the optimum solution in terms of the uh, standards requirements, by that I mean the technical specification or, or, or other issues that are uh, in the standards. So we want to do that um, both in terms of serving uh, UK government, first and foremost, our primary duty, should UK government be requesting support for the delivery of a regulatory policy. So you might imagine some future environmental regulation in the UK or, or something else. And uh, UK government approaches us to say we would like a, a standard to support this because we think this is not um, not uh, going to be well served by a prescriptive regulation. Could you give us an industry standard to support it? We will look at the workload that we have. Maybe there's something in the pipeline uh, or maybe there's a gap and then we would respond. So in the same way, uh, the European Commission in the delivery of its uh, um, uh, regulatory programme turns to the, the country members, the Sen and Senelec community, and, and requests support in the preparation of a standard. So our ambition here is very simple. As with all of our industry and consumer stakeholders, they would like those to be the common standard, just, just one standard. So they, the conflict of interest would only, uh, would only, it could only be a conflict of interest if we were being pulled in two directions. But what we're trying to achieve here is, is a common standard that can serve, potentially serve divergent regulatory requirements. And you see that all the time. I mean, you see that a standard, for example, a test method standard will be the same standard. So industry is just having to use one test method, but the actual uh, uh, um, target, the level, the, the requirement that may be set in a regulation could be slightly different, but the standard is the same. So one test method, uh, uh, multiple regulatory uh, um, solutions. So I think it's perfectly possible. Our ambition there is very much to keep keep UK influence at the maximum level that we can 
within the international and regional standards uh, community. Uh, in one of the other answers uh, to the questions I've just been typing, I was trying to make the point that the regional standard system is additive to the international standard system. So Europe is a, a very mature a community of countries, developed economies, and we have quite sophisticated needs for standards in Europe, driven by governments and industry and, and consumers and the environmental movement. Uh, and we try to respond to that. Not all of those needs are necessary at the international level. So what we do in the national catalogue is to see a, a body of standards, over 85% of British standards are international and regional. They are additive, they're not conflicting. And about 57% of British standards are reviewed, many of them adopted identically from the international catalogue directly, passing through the regional engine. So it's very much a facilitation role, Paul, that we're trying to fulfill here to optimize the stakeholder expectation that they want one standard used everywhere. Did Thank that you. answer the question? Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, if, uh, I, I'll just deal with the three questions on, on regulatory issues, two from Jorge Fiera, one from Mark Barsby. Jorge asks, uh, how can we get involved in discussion related to the review UK regulations that will take place after Brexit? And he asks, how the UKCA market and how it works for the CE market can both be used in packaging? Uh, Hoy, I'm sorry, those are, those are regulatory questions that we can't answer as, as standards body. I, I think you would Richard, need to direct yeah. yourself to the Department for Business, who will yeah. be able to help you. You're welcome to get in touch and we can give you a, can give you a contact person. Mark Varsby, similar question, in a similar answer. Could companies use the UKCA mark now? I think the answer is no, that isn't, that isn't yet. Uh, uh, it, while it is in a, an adopted legal act, it doesn't take effect until January. Uh, I, I say that, but again, really, that's a question for, for government, for Department for Business, or whichever is the relevant department for the UKCA mark, your, the regulation you're, you're thinking of. But again, uh, if that's not enough, welcome to put you in touch with, with someone for that. Um, Richard, there's a, there's a couple of questions here. Dave Sheedy, I've got looking at one here, 2.29 p.m. So sorry, David, that's been sitting around for 20 minutes. Um, and a couple of others I've seen, at least one other, it, it, talking about the sort of forcible adoption of harmonized standards. Yes. Um, so the answer to that is, is, is no. Um, we, we need to be clear that post-transition, autonomous an autonomous regulatory system in the UK will require the UK to have its own uh, capacity to develop and adopt standards that we choose so we will not be able to 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 say to anybody that that we have to adopt a harmonized European standard it may be that a a, a standard that is being worked on with the intention of, of being a harmonized standard for the European countries is also useful in the UK, but um, it's not our expectation and not our approach to say that post transition, we are going to adopt all harmonized ENs. So I think the answer to that, Paul, is no. Right, great, thank you, Scott. Frank, there was one you wanted to answer, I saw. Sorry, Dave, it was to Dave Sheedy. Yeah. Thank you. Was the one you wanted to answer? I thought I saw. There's one on blood on the floor for you, Frank, it says here. Nigel. Yes, uh, Nigel. Yes, I, I, the, um, the question's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I think we need to be clear in saying this isn't about um, imposing a, a, you know, a particular UK way of doing things. Um, the UK um, obviously has um, a, a high degree of leadership in in, in international standards, but I, I don't think this is this this is the international way of doing things. This isn't the the, the UK way of doing things. Um, so I, I, I I'm interested in in, the, in that particular example from 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 Nigel there, um, but I, I I I don't think it's about about the acceptance of the British way of doing things. I think it's the acceptance of the international route the, the the one standard for one uh for one aspect of a product or service it that that should be what we are what we campaign for internationally 
Um, so I, um, yeah, so I, I think that um, I, I, don't, I, I don't see the need for blood on the floor. Okay, I've got a right. question here. I found a question here. Oh, Richard, you're going to answer NSAI. Very nice. uh, NS, uh, yes, yes, I was coming to that one. NSAI. Um, yes, thank you, NSAI. Welcome from, from Ireland. Uh, uh, have we considered the risk of our resources being stretched due to some of these items um, meeting the demands of developing standards for UK regulation and European standards and, and standards to suit bilateral agreements with the US? Well, I. Uh, I think a number of these things are actually the, the same things that that we have a, a set of standards that our, our stakeholders develop for various purposes and we're not expecting there to be particularly different standards to support uh, US agreement we have a set of international standards that we that we use already but if the, if there are um, uh, individual standards that, that, that meet a particular need that's identified with with a trading partner but for a one-off that doesn't conflict with an international standard that we already have and then we could do that and we have the resources to do that we have resources to do that now um developing standards that support uk regulation uh, and european standards well as, as we've said our expectation is that that uh, in the vast majority of cases that the, the reg that certainly Next year, the, the regulations will be will be the same, and so the standards are the, are the same. Um, and it's only where regulation differs in such a way that you really need a different standard, then you look at a different process. Does that mean you're involved in two processes, and does that make it difficult? Well, I, I think again that that depends on how it how, how it all plays out and how the how it works with the regulations. So, I, I I don't think we're we're too concerned that our resources in terms of standard development will be overstretched where where we are in in terms of, of uh, standards makers is on uh, on an up uh, a quite significant uphill trajectory in terms of uh, new um new committee members coming on board so our resources are increasing rather than decreasing and i think that we're in a position to cope with with that i uh, think uh, if i can add to that i would the, say that yes we are constantly appraising the, the, the need for resources and we are constantly actually recruiting and we've got various new posts coming on stream this year and uh, notwithstanding the COVID-19 issues. So that the board of the BSI group is absolutely determined that we will do whatever it takes in terms of resourcing to meet all of these uh, uh, challenges, opportunities. So, I mean, it's a, frankly a very exciting time because it's a time when the whole world really needs standards if we're going to recover from our COVID-19 at, at pace and uh, UK and indeed thank you to NSAI and Irish influence in all this is really fundamental so I really appreciate NSAI joining joining our conference today. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of points about Northern Ireland and, and again you know Richard and I have been having uh, various calls in fact we've got a call I think this afternoon with Northern Ireland again and uh, I re really appreciate the position of Northern Ireland in this. It really makes the whole point so, so real that when you, when you have a community in Northern Ireland manufacturing everything, as they say, from aircraft wings to chicken wings, that, that common standards are absolutely fundamental for those products to be shipped around, whether they're shipping around the, the EU or whether they're shipping around the rest of the UK. So common standards are going to be absolutely fundamental to that. So maintaining this line, managing the resources so that we've got sufficient resources to address it and participating in, in the international and regional standard systems is really fundamental to the well-being of those people, uh, manufacturers and, and consumers, and, and simplifying the life of regulators. It's really fundamental. This is not something that, that one would throw away. Um, I answered another question about, about China, saying it was very clear from our, my Chinese opposite number, the director, uh, um, the minister actually in, in, in the state administration market regulation. I asked him very directly um, about this point of one standard used everywhere. And he simply said, why would we want our industries to use more than one standard? We just want one standard used everywhere. So th this is the journey that we're on together in the world of standards. That this, this doesn't mean, of course, that, that governments in countries everywhere uh, don't have a right to regulate. Of course, they have a right to regulate. Uh, uh, the question is, how do we, as the standards community, support that to deliver the regulatory policy that our governments uh, want, want to deliver? And of course, our role in delivering a, a standard is a standard is not a piece of 
of law in the sense of written by lawyers, it's written by stakeholders. So it's a complementary tool to the delivery of regulatory policy. Great, thank you, Scott. Uh, Peter Kenley, interesting question. And so like standards, I understand them are to promote the interest of the EU trading bloc. Seems to me we must go for UK and international and not try to be in both camps. Well, I, as Scott mentioned it uh, earlier as well, that uh, the, the standards that we develop in Europe, I mean, what, what we look to predominantly, our purpose, and we've had these discussions in the sense of governance, is to adopt international standards within Europe and make sure that we're all using them identically. And only when there aren't inter international standards, we develop European only ones. And the, these standards, the use of these standards are for, for businesses and of course for the consumers who consume the products and services of those businesses. They are, they are not responses to regulatory policy. It's a small number of European standards. It's something like 13% of European standards that respond directly to EU NLF regulations. And so it's, I don't think it's correct to say that these standards are developed for the interests of the EU trading bloc. They're developed for the needs of the businesses and other stakeholders within the member countries. And member countries who are not in the EU are, are very important within the standards, like the UK side. Um, Switzerland and, and, and Norway and others have always been very important within within Sen and Senlac. So um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that we, that we that we need to move away from those standards because our stakeholders say to us how important the European standards are as part of a broader international uh, international uh, system of standards. The, so I, Richard, you might you might add to that. that I mean, hmm. for example, in the Senlac world, in the electrotechnical world. I think it's something like 85% of Senelec standards are, are based directly on IEC standards. So you, the world, electricity is common all over the world. So, so what we're trying to do is actually to avoid having any European regional standards where there isn't a particular specificity that European industries, consumers or, or other stakeholders actually need that can't be satisfied through a, an international standard. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so I think that that's a fundamental point in this, in this slight misunderstanding perhaps around where standards come from. This, this isn't the world of the 1950s anymore. Um, we, we organize stakeholder representation in standards development uh, through, through national uh, participation, but there's no, there's no nationality requirement about who those people are. So in BSI committees, you'll find people from all over the world participating in BSI committees and from companies that are owned and headquartered all over the world. You'll find Chinese experts uh, participating in BSI committees very successfully and proudly, and so they should. So the whole international system is built around this model that you participate in the standards development committee through the country where you happen to be based, working or, or, or living. And that's all part of the, the, the underpinning principle of stakeholder engagement that we can, we can uh, um, demonstrate through, through the processes we're following that we have the full stakeholder voice of that community brought to bear on this issue. It is not about the color of the passport that you're carrying in the committee. Uh Two questions from, from Jim Sibley. Hi, Jim. Uh, one about Northern Ireland, which, which again is a question on what the regulatory regime will be. How will the arrangements work? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. Um, but, but nevertheless, it, it's one of the things that, I, that I'm sure the uh, people in Northern Ireland, UK government and the EU are, are working through. And there's, there's a, there are committee structures within the protocol to look at that sort of thing. But that's, that's a bit more of a regulatory question. But Jim, I wanted to, to answer your question about the harmonised standards be adopted without the Annex, Annex ZA, that's the, the CEN Annex that shows the relationship between, between the standards and the regulation, Annex ZZ and Senelec doing the same thing. Could harmonised standards be adopted in the UK without the, the Annex? Well, the, the Annex is, is, uh, is a part of the standard. It's, it's an Annex, but it's a part of the standard, so, so it would still be a, adopted. Um, I think more broadly, would there need to be a separate annex for the UK? Well, well, possibly. And and the conversations that I mentioned earlier that we're having with UK government about how a designated standard system works, we need to look at all of these questions about what the links are between the regulation and the standard, how they're expressed. Does there need to be a different annex when in fact at the beginning? 
the essential requirements are the same and the standard is the same, does there need to be a different annex for the UK? Maybe, maybe not. But that's one of the aspects, Jim, that we're that we're considering uh, within this work. I think we're coming towards towards the end. Scott, do you want to do you want to summarise to close? Um, well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate as I scan through the questions that we've addressed some, but not others. I've I've got Adrian Wyatt on on the challenges around consensus approach, and I yes. I think Adrian, I mean, you know, that 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 comes back to some of the conversations earlier today in the conference around inclusivity, and of course, consensus shouldn't mean just outvoting one group outvoting another group i mean inclusivity truly means you're actually respecting the the genuine needs that you need so I, I, that's a very fair point um harmonized and designated standards from julia yes okay um i i'm what i'd like to say to everybody is really appreciate the comments we we will um, keep these comments and we will respond to you we will go through them all and make sure we have answered them all together because it's a it's a difficult environment i you know i prefer to to meet and look at you in the face and talk to you face to face but actually you've asked some really excellent questions and i'm getting a, a, a good mood good mood music from from what we've seen here and i really appreciate the effort that everybody's made to articulate their their points and we you know we we must answer you all so we will do that um, and again, Richard and Frank, thank you very much for your uh, excellent and measured presentations that led us through that uh, earlier in the session. So thank you all. Richard, let's, shall we close and, and thank our yeah, yeah, I think, I think one participants? That's it. Yes, thank you very much, everyone, for, for listening and for your, for your questions and, and, your, and your comments. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it did. I think this is, this is the, the, the last part of the, of the conversation. I read all my emails, so I'm more than happy to, to receive emails from anybody on any subject, and, uh, and we will deal with it. So appreciate all of your involvement today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, everybody.